It's hard to argue against the concept that the world is more connected now than it has ever been before. With the click of a button, we can communicate with people from all across the globe with vastly different societal and cultural ideas. Yet this leads to propensity for us to assume that before these times, in particular in the ancient world, peoples and civilizations were like islands unto themselves with little connection or influence on each other. While this is, of course, a gross oversimplification, it is not helped by the way history is taught and presented. We talk about the Romans, the Greeks, the Huns, the Scythians, but less obviously how these different societies interacted with each other. Suffice to say, this model of isolationism does not really reflect the historical reality of the past or the ancient world. In contrast, one of the most striking examples of cross-cultural communication exchange in the past was the so-called Silk Roads, brought to public interest most recently by China's Belt and Road Initiative, a project intended to promote infrastructure developments along these historic routes that connected ancient China with Central Asia and even Europe to some extent. The golden age for these historic routes was arguably the first Silk Roads era, lasting from around 100 BCE to 250 AD, where trade of glassware, silk, porcelain, perfume, wine, and other luxury goods flowed between the many disparate cultures on the route. The Han Dynasty Chinese, Parthians, Romans, Kushans, Mauryans, and nomadic tribal confederations such as the Xiongnu were all participants in and beneficiaries of this extensive trade network. Unfortunately, there are very few textual sources describing how these trade and diplomatic routes functioned during the period, particularly over land, with almost all of our evidence being material through myriad archaeological finds. For Eastern textual sources, we do, for example, have the accounts of Gan Ying and Zhang Chen, who travelled as far as Parthia. However, Western sources are comparatively severely lacking. Isidorus of Charax's Parthian Stations does describe the beginning of the route through Parthia. However, he only gets as far as Merv before turning south towards modern Kandahar. If he was following the Silk Roads to China, we would have expected him to turn east at Merv towards Bactra, and then up through the Zarafsham and Fergana valleys through the Taran Basin, and arrive finally in Han China. The closest we do have in Western textual sources is an esoteric reference in Ptolemy's geography to a caravan itinerary his source, Marinus of Tyre, had purchased from a trader called Mais Titianus. This trader's agents apparently travelled along the Silk Roads at least as far as the Stone Tower, a landmark near the modern Xinjiang border into China. One of the main reasons for this dearth of information about the overland route is that goods transported along the Silk Roads were often moved by traders operating over relatively short distances. This was especially necessitated by ongoing political tension between the constituent powers in the regions. That being said, the opportunity for a single group to travel the entire length of the Silk Road was definitely possible during around 100 CE, which is when Mais Titianus' account is described as happening. This was due to relative peace at the time between Rome and Parthia in the west, as well as stability in the east following the Han Dynasty's repacification of the Taran Basin region by the general Ban Chao. Furthermore, in the Chinese sources, this Ban Chao is described as having encountered a group of representatives from a distant land, who he escorts onwards to the Chinese emperor in Luoyang. Many scholars have identified this group of representatives as, in fact, being Mais Titianus's party of agents. Taking all this information together, we have the story of a group of Western traders travelling almost the entire length of the Silk Roads and interacting with many different cultures before returning back home with a wealth of knowledge about faraway lands. How did these traders view the customs of the people they encountered? What sights did they experience? What trade goods did they take note of? Heartbreakingly though, these questions may never be answered as the original source is now lost to time, existing only as mere references in other texts. But what if it wasn't? What if tomorrow news comes out about a group of Silk Roads archaeologists uncovering it in one of their digs? Or perhaps maybe it is suddenly discovered in a private collection and released for study? If you'll indulge me, I plan to engage in some academic speculation and attempt to reconstruct what Mais Titianus' itinerary may look like if it is ever uncovered. In pursuit of this, I'm looking to bring together the archaeological evidence, as well as what textual evidence we do have, to create somewhat of an image of the Silk Roads at the end of the 1st century CE. Furthermore, by analysing other similar Western sources, such as the Periplus of the Erythrian Sea, I hope to present this image 
through the lens of someone from and living in these regions, complete with the inaccuracies and misunderstandings that we would expect from a source of this type. The compilation and completion of this project will hopefully yield a more digestible and concise study of the First Silk Roads era, and hopefully, just hopefully, give us a snapshot into the world and adventure that Mys Titianus' party actually experienced.